I am so pleased that I can share a few minutes of today with you. And as we move into a new year, we come with hopes, but also uncertainties. There is an Irish saying, may your troubles be less and may your blessings be more and nothing but happiness come through your door. Well, wouldn't that be great? But how realistic is it? And that's why I want us to take a few moments looking at Psalm 46, because it can give us a good start to the new year. Grasp what it's saying will give a firm footing for anything that is ahead. A greeting card said, Wishing you 12 months of success, 52 weeks of laughter, 365 days of fun, 8,760 hours of joy, 525,600 minutes of good happenings, and 31,536,000 seconds of happiness. Well, again, a great thought, but let's get real as we turn to Psalm 46. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Selah, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our Fortress, Selah. A man sees his wife's name come up on his phone, but it's his four-year-old who has figured out how to use the speed button. She says, Daddy, we had a rest and Mummy won't wake up. It's a diabetic coma. And in the words of Psalm 46, the mountains are falling into the heart of the sea. The waters are roaring and foaming, the mountains quaking with their surging. Take away the poetry and this is what it means. Daddy, we had a rest and mummy won't wake up. It means it's stage four cancer. I don't love you anymore. We're sorry, but we're going to have to let you go. And suddenly, our security is gone. The earth is giving way. Now, when such things happen, and they will to us or people we care about, how do we get to the point where we can say, we will not fear? Well now, Psalm 46 is about this. And how can we not fear in a world like ours? So many uncertainties, so many insecurities and things to cause us anxiety. Well, God helps us as we turn to this psalm. 
We can find an ever-present help in trouble, even when the mountains fall and the waters roar. But how does that work? Well, the psalmist gives us three very important steps to take, dividing on the word selah. You notice that? It probably means stop and listen. Take this in, grasp this. And the first thing to take in is remember what we know. And we know that God is our refuge and strength. And Israel could remember their own history and know the truth of this. During the reign of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib invaded, bent on conquering Jerusalem. In desperation, Hezekiah sent gold and silver as a peace offering, hoping to appease the power-hungry Sennacherib, but to no avail. The Lord sent word to Hezekiah that Sennacherib would not step foot inside the city of Jerusalem. So Hezekiah stood firm and refused to give in. The prophet Isaiah told the king's messengers, Do not be afraid. God will cause him to fall by the sword. And an angel of the Lord slew 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. Sennacherib never stepped foot inside Jerusalem. Just as Isaiah had said, God was an ever-present help in trouble. And by the way, the historical account of Sennacherib is in the British Museum in London. He never says why he didn't take Jerusalem, just that he turned away. And it took just one angel. 700 years later, in a garden inside Jerusalem, they seized and arrested Jesus, and one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it, and struck a man, cutting off his ear. Jesus stopped it, saying, I could call on 12 legions of angels to help, but this isn't the way. That's 60,000 angels. And if just one angel could do what happened to the Assyrian army, think of 60,000. Thank Christ that with all the power available for him, he willingly went to the cross for us, that we might be rescued from an eternity apart from God. And let's grasp the point Israel could look back and say, God has rescued us. And we can also look back knowing God has rescued us from our own sin. God is our refuge. Remember that. Okay, horrible things may happen to us in this fallen, broken world, but God is also our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. We may say, I don't want help in trouble. I want the removal of the trouble. But God doesn't always work that way. King Hezekiah had stripped away from him all his human resources so that he had to depend upon God alone. But we can face the trouble with confidence. God will provide what we need. In our messed up world, we are not promised an absence of trouble. We are promised strength to endure. No one knew that better than Martin Luther. Do you know he wrote a famous hymn based on Psalm 46? The most likely story is that it was written in October 1527 as the plague was approaching. It begins... A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Luther's friend had been burned at the stake for believing the gospel. He was being hunted, but he finishes. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. 
The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Well, we can't explain how God is working his purposes out at the time. But remember, God is our refuge and strength. But that isn't enough to help us in our troubled moments. We need something more. And secondly, we need to be refreshed by whom we know. How can that happen for us it is vividly portrayed in verses 4 and 5. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. For Israel, what was that river? Ancient cities are established on a river. London has the Thames, Paris has the Seine, Chicago, Lake Michigan. Not Jerusalem. It sits on a high point. The way people get water is from a spring outside the city wall. Now, anticipating a devastating attack by the Assyrians, King Hezekiah was troubled that Jerusalem's main water source lay outside the city walls. Not only would they lose access to their water supply, but the enemy would enjoy an unlimited amount of water for its troops. So Hezekiah launched one of the most technologically complex operations in all ancient history. He rerouted the water source into the city. What they did was this. They bored a lengthy tunnel through solid rock. Some 500 years later, the Romans ruined Jerusalem and gradually the tunnel became hidden. But then, in 1838, it was rediscovered, and I've walked through it. The full length of the water tunnel is over a third of a mile through solid rock. Now, the psalmist's picture of a river whose streams make glad the city of God and God is within her, she will not fall, but God will help her at break of day. Was that literally true? Really? Their thirst was quenched by the water. It was literally the water of life to them. And the psalmist is saying, the significance of this is greater than water to quench our physical thirst. Because we have a God who will quench our inner thirst. And for us, there is even a greater significance. Do you realise that? Just don't quench the spirit within. Stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer. Don't block off. Don't quench what he is saying. Obey him. Spend time with God, learning to hear what his voice is saying through his word. Pray, meditate, worship, read the Bible. And as we learn to live a life in the Spirit, not quenching him, the result will be an inner freedom. A freedom to have the fullness of the Spirit, which will issue itself in the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. And don't we want that? Let's open our hearts to receive God's blessings. We can't avoid trouble. In fact, if we went through life in a protective armour bubble around us, it would force everyone to have to respond to God in order to get those benefits. Everyone would be coerced by God, and that's not how it works in a broken world. Our security is of our souls with God. So, sealer this moment. 
stop and think. Right now, remember the kind of God we have. He is our refuge. He is our strength and be refreshed by him. His spirit is within every true believer. Don't block what he wants to do in and through us. Let go of what we want and receive what he wants. And one more thing, rest in whom we know. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. We won't lose anything of lasting worth because nothing compares to God's power. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You know, Jacob was a lying deceiver. But on the human side, Jesus came from his family line. And Jesus is supremely God with us. And if we want to come and see the works of the Lord now, look at Emmanuel. God with us in our Lord Jesus Christ. He came that first time to make peace with God possible as we trust him as our Saviour and Lord. He will come again leading to wars ceasing and a new earth and a new heaven and we can be part of it. No more tears because no more troubles and that's as certain and secure as he came that first time. People ask, why has God allowed so much pain? We don't have an easy answer for questions like that. When God says, be still, this is not the stillness of inactivity, much less the stillness of despair. It's the stillness of watching what God is doing in and through our circumstances. Often, we won't understand why God does what he does or our knowledge will be incomplete. But in saying that, we also trust that the purposes of God are working themselves out even in the worst things that happen in the world. And when verse 10 says we are to be still and know, the stillness leads to the knowing. It's when we admit that we don't know that we are most likely to learn something. Sometimes the most spiritual thing we can say is, I don't know. Because the confession of our weakness becomes the ground for a new revelation of God's strength. Sometimes we talk too much when hard times come. As if by talking we will explain the ways of the Almighty. We are much more likely to know the ways of the Lord if we are first still before him. It's like going to a, a great art gallery and rushing past 30 paintings in five minutes as if speed improves comprehension. It would be better to spend 30 minutes studying one masterpiece. Be still and know, says the Lord. And what will we know? Be still and know that I am God. Not be still and know the details. Or be still and know the reasons. As important as those things are, they pale before the knowledge of God himself. It's not in the noise of our own effort that we grow spiritually. But when we are finally quiet before the Lord, then we receive the greatest knowledge of which mankind is capable. The knowledge that he is God. I have had a conversation with the Lord about the heartaches of life. It usually goes something like this. The Lord says to me, so you don't like what I just did. Do you think I made a mistake? 
saying, I know that you don't, but it seems that way. The Lord never seems bothered by that. He already knows how I feel about things. Derek, I did what I did for my own reasons. But I did it without consulting you, so you would know that I take full responsibility for what happened. That conversation has been a great comfort to me. I prefer to worship a God who can suddenly and without warning do things that make no sense to me. Only an almighty God gives and takes life, rides upon the storm, sends prosperity and also trouble, answers my prayers and sometimes leaves me speechless and confused, all without feeling any need to explain himself to me. The mystery of it all ends up building my faith. Why would I want to worship a God I could fully understand? How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. So where does all this leave us? The answer is, possibly we're all still hurting. No one is immune from the sufferings of humanity. We live with pain, we live with sadness every day, and there's no escape from that reality. When we hurt, we have two choices. We can hurt with God, or we can hurt without God. If you are hurting as you hear these words, you may feel as if you have come to the end of your endurance. Hang on to the Lord. If you turn away from him, things can only get worse. The pioneer missionary Hudson Taylor reached multitudes of Chinese people who had never heard the gospel. During the terrible days of the Boxer Rebellion, 1900 to 1901, missionaries were being killed. He went through such an agony of soul. And he summarised his spiritual condition. I can't read. I can't think. I can't pray. But I can trust. There will be times when we can't read the Bible. Sometimes we won't be able to focus our thoughts on God at all. Often we will not even be able to pray. But in those moments... We can't do anything else, but we can still trust in the loving purposes of our Heavenly Father. So, remember what we know. The Lord Almighty is with us. Be refreshed by whom we know. He is like a stream of living water. Be filled with the Spirit and rest. Be still and know that I am God. And do you realise there is a shortcut to get all of this downloaded and activated in our lives and ready to help us in trouble and into the future? It's the instruction note for the psalm. Did you notice that? It was to be set to music as an Alamoth song. Now that's a song for a soprano or female voices. Some of us don't fit the original purpose, but let's get the main point. The truths of this psalm are best activated in us through song. You see, there is something about singing the praises of God that makes them more real to us. So lift up our voices in praise. When trouble comes, it's often a sacrifice of praise. We don't feel like doing it, but it's a command to sing. 
We can't gather with the church and stand with our mouths shut. The Bible never says, let those who have beautiful voices sing, as if natural talent were required to praise God. We are told to sing more times than we are told to witness, teach, baptize, or to bring offerings. As James says, is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. The psychologist said, if your face wants to smile, let it. If it doesn't, make it. And I say the same of songs of praise. Christianity, did you know this? It started as a singing religion. One of the earliest descriptions of Christians by a secular historian came in a letter by Pliny the Younger, asking a superior in Rome, what should I do about all these Christians? He said that they would gather early in the morning and sing joyfully to one another, singing hymns to Christ as to a God. And it's always been so. In Japan, after the end of World War II, a young tailor who lived in Hiroshima was out of town the day the bomb fell. He searched through the ruins and couldn't even locate his house until he heard a voice calling him faintly from a mound of flesh he could only recognise as his sister by the print of the dress burned into her skin. He watched her die and determined to hate the enemy forever. But as he wandered in a daze through Hiroshima, he came across a church which had three walls standing and no roof. And inside those walls, a group of people were singing hymns. And he was drawn to the joy in their voices in the midst of destruction. Week after week, the young tailor came to hear the songs and leave before the sermon because he wasn't interested. But finally, the music drew him in and he stayed to hear the message that there is a loving God who cares and offers forgiveness and the ability to forgive. And the tailor came to faith in Christ. You see, congregational song does important things that speech alone cannot do. Music speaks to parts of the brain that words alone cannot. When we get to heaven... The book of Revelation makes clear that we will all be singing then. Congregational singing is not just a command, it's our destiny. And Paul gives a direct command to the church. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Notice the audience there is one another. Our singing is a way to communicate with one another in the church. We build one another up by speaking to one another in song. We are teaching one another about God, driving the truths of the gospel deep into our hearts and into the hearts of every person. And notice the command is to sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We sing to Jesus himself with our mouths and our hearts. And making music in our heart doesn't just mean to feel the music, it's to sing with our whole self. When singing a hymn, or song together, we become participants rather than observers of worship. We become givers as well as receivers. You know, there were times when congregations were not allowed to sing in church. Early church life was modelled on the small synagogue with its singing. But as the church became institutionalised and built buildings, some leaders began to think of the church as modelled on the Jerusalem temple with its professional choirs, like the sons of Korah. 
They also got scared because opponents used hymns to teach different doctrine. A rule was issued, no others shall sing in the church save only the ordained, all male singers. And in many places hymns were sung only by priests in Greek or Latin, which of course the people didn't understand. When the Reformation began in the 15th century, this began to change. And when we sing, we are spiritually strengthened for trials. Singing brings strength for trial. I don't think it's a coincidence that an earthquake shook open the prison doors while Paul and Silas were singing. Whether Luke intended for us to make the connection between singing and setting the prisoner free, that happened. And what happens today? Hear the words of a pastor imprisoned for his faith. They put chains on our hands and feet, yet we discover that chains are splendid musical instruments. When we clang them together in rhythm, we could sing. This is the day, clink clank. This is the day, clink clank, which the Lord has made, clink clank. Which the Lord has made, clink clank. Persecuted Christians are showing us the truth. Singing strengthens and helps us persevere in the face of trial. If it can strengthen them, in the face of trials, what can it do for us? So even in suffering, sing persistently in scripture, joy and singing are bound together. If we struggle for joy, sing. If we are joyful, sing. God has bound joy and singing together for us. Singing has a unique way of bringing our heart, soul, mind and strength together to focus completely on God. In an age of distraction, singing grabs the attention of all our senses and focuses us on God. The Apostle John describes a glimpse of eternity with a great multitude of people from every tribe, peoples and languages singing, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb of God. Singing the song of Christ the Lamb of God sacrificed for us, singing his praises. I hope you'll be there, singing the song of our Saviour, Jesus Christ.